by the way, is down about 26 points. You know, let's just take a quick look at the uh, the, the big stocks, right, which uh, were moving. One is Asian Paints, if we can have that intraday up. Uh, what is it, what is it done after, what, 30 minutes of trade behind us? Uh, 30, 35 minutes. Asian Paints is down one and a half, uh, one and a quarter. It's off the lows, by the way. Uh, Lever is the other one. Uh, that also had bounced off the day's low. The open was the low uh, uh, on that one. There was... Uh, of course, uh, LTTS, that is uh, LNT Technology Services, which was responding to numbers that had started lower. Uh, it's been down for a while, and that is actually the one which is taking a sharp knock, three and a third of a percent lower. CoForge is also reacting to numbers. That, on the other side, was one of the top gainers uh, that we uh, had uh, through and through. So uh, things are looking uh, pretty good uh, as far as uh, the uh, as far as the uh, CoForge uh, stock is concerned. Two hundred uh, bucks. 4,175 4, on the name. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, reacting to a strong set of numbers. Uh, the company has seen the highest ever order in intake of $345 million. The company has also upped its F523 revenue guidance to 22% from 20% earlier, and the adjusted EBITDA margin guidance is, has been maintained at 185 to 19%. Sudhir Singh, Executive Director and CEO at the company, is joining us. Mr. Singh, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much uh, for your time. You know, at an environment like this, when uh, it's kind of a bit of gloom and doom, at least people are pro projecting that a slowdown is coming, a recession is coming in some cases, you're upping your revenue guidance to 22%. Uh, could, you, uh, could you tell us what uh, led you to do this? What were the reasons behind it? Well, it's been a, it's been a very solid quarter three. Uh, we've signed, uh, you were right, it's not just the highest ever order intake in the history of the firm. We've signed five large deals in a somewhat uncertain macro that everyone's talking about. The highest number of large deals that we've signed, one of them was a $50 million plus deal, two of them were $30 million plus TCB deals. Uh, we've seen our gross margin go up 133 bits, which continues to allow us to invest in sales and marketing and backend capability build. And the fact that we have uh, five large deals under a belt, the fact that we have the highest ever order intake in a quarter, the fact, even more importantly, that our 12-month order book, again, is at a record high, gives us the confidence that we should be able to withstand most scenarios uh, specific to an uncertain macro that we should be able to meet. That's why we've given a guidance at 22%. We believe that guidance also is conservative because that guidance at 22% means that we only need to grow 3.5% next quarter. We've already done 37 in quarter three, which is a shorter quarter. So we do think we'll meet 22 percent, hopefully exceed 22 percent as well. Okay, that is a very optimistic view. I think I haven't heard you so optimistic in a while. We've been speaking for so many years. But I get your point that, you know, amidst all the challenges, this is a, a super normal growth, so to speak. You have a $2 billion revenue milestone as well. Can you tell us when could you achieve it realistically? And will you look for any acquisitions uh, to bolster growth and reach this target? We're going to uh, touch a billion dollars in the current quarter. The quarter that just closed is when we hit the billion dollar run rate. This year, which closes in quarter four, obviously, is when we hit the annualized, uh, the annual billion dollar run rate. The intent is to get to a $2 billion with great speed. If you look at our record over the last five years, the last 20 quarters, we have come through most scenarios, including COVID, when the travel industry went down and we had exposure to it figured out a way to drive very, very strong growth. We've been growing almost 20% over the last five odd years. Kagger, we'd like to continue to move with speed, hopefully greater speed as we get to $2 billion. That's how I would characterize. All right. Uh, Sudhir, if you could give us a timeline. By when do you get to $2 billion? And also the record deal wins. You know, that's very, very encouraging. For FY24, what sort of a broad number could we work with based on you know the current scenario? So we, we haven't called out publicly, even on our investor calls, we haven't established publicly the timeline by when we want to hit our $2 billion. Internally, as you can imagine, we have the quarter and we have the year pat down. That's what we are planning towards. Uh, the large deals, the velocity that you see obviously has taken some time in building up. If you look at us as a firm over the last five years, last 20 quarters, we've talked about an ability to command a price premium, drive margins up, use those margins to keep investing in sales marketing capability. At a time like this, when macros are, are, are uncertain, is when a firm like us believes, when a team like us believes you need to lean in, drive growth, differentiate. The team that we've built up, the capabilities that we've created, is what's led us to sign 
five deals in the shortest quarter of the year in the midst of uncertain macro. So, I mean, it's, it's been a cumulative effect, effort, it's taken time to build, and it gradually seems to be giving us yielding the dividends that we always wanted to see. So, when you say drive margins up, how much do you think you can expand margins further? It's been in this 13-14% range, but you are doing a lot, whether it is increase in offshoring, operational efficiencies. How much do you think the margin band could move up to in the near future? Well, in the near future, we think we have significant leverage to be able to take the margin up. If you look at just the current quarter that closed, our gross margin went up 133 bips. We've used almost all of it, about 120 out of that 133, into continuing to invest in, uh, in sales, marketing, and capability to ensure that the growth rate does not slacken over the gradient we've built over the past few years. So we think, given how offshore has done for us, our, our offshore revenue has gone up 16% over the last nine quarters. That's a huge swing. We have significant margin buffers. It's not a question of how much can we grow. We think we can grow significantly. It's more a question of when do we actually dial down the investments and let most of the uh, most of the GM start flowing down to the uh, to the EBITDA and to the PAT. Current uh, current scenario, we suspect we'll continue investing. We'll continue chasing growth, but margins have the offshoring having gone having gone up, the utilization having gone up, the number of GET graduate engineer trainee pool having gone up gives us significant margin cushion at a time like this. So even if FI24 uh, throws a curveball, you should be you, you well placed overall on all aspects. Do you expect it to? Uh, that is, yeah, this calendar year to be uh, to be uh, significantly tougher than what you've had to face last year. Uh, this calendar year, especially the second half, of the macros we're all aware have been deteriorating. I think we've still found a clear way to accelerate growth while the macros have gone and trended in the direction that they have. Currently, where we stand, and as we consider the next year, fiscal year 24, we feel very, very good. We feel very, very good, one, because the locked-in order book is as strong as it is. It's at about $845 million already for the next 12 months. The order intake has been the highest ever at about $345-odd million. We have five large deals which will actually start delivering revenue impact from Q1 of next year with a little bit of a lag. So we feel very good about the revenue buffers and the margin parameter buffers that we built up for the business right now. Mm. You know, Sudhir, uh, on a day-to-day -day business, we get a lot of managements, we get a lot of experts as well. We keep asking them, how are you feeling about the sector, the IT space? Well, you're pretty much, uh, you know, blazing all cylinders as we speak. But besides the operational performance and besides the path ahead, there are a couple of other aspects. One is, you had an ADR listing plan. That was pushed back a little bit. So what's the update out there, point number one? And point number two, bearing stake used to be around 70%. That's come down to around 40%. Any clarity on that? Because that's a bit of a supply overhang. Go ahead. Sure. So the area we've been very clear about, we've, uh, we've already listed with the SEC. We have an F1 file. We keep refiling it. We've always maintained that the firm is intent on doing an ADR. And yet, at the same time, we're in no tearing hurry to do it till the market stabilizes. It's a secondary ADR. We'll keep looking at the market. We will keep refreshing the F1 application. Doesn't take too much effort once you've done it first time around. And we will then pull the trigger around that once the market is in a position where it is more receptive to secondary ADRs than it is at the current point in time. The second question that you had around bearing, bearing your right, has come down from 70 to 40 percent. They're very valued shareholders as far as we are concerned. They've been extremely productive on the board in terms of the, of the guidance and the support that they've provided. We hope they're, they're going to be there for the longer term. Uh, and, and their plans in terms of how they move forward, of course, is something that they would be best placed to answer questions yeah. around. Uh, I, I do understand that you are quite optimistic about uh, the future, but some of your verticals have seen a bit of pressure, right? Whether it's insurance, which was down about 3%, BFSI, in fact, was flat, so there was no growth there. Travel tourism, barely about a 2% growth. Uh, can you uh, talk about whether you saw any kind of uh, furloughs in the insurance and BFSI sector? What was the reason for the weakness there? And would you extrapolate that for the rest of the year? So let, me, let me make sure I get this right, right? We've seen significant furloughs and we've seen significant growth. BFSI is growing year on year 33%. Travel is growing 25%. Q1 
Quarter three, as we all know, is a seasonally weak quarter for IT services, and yet our performance has been one of the best across the industry. So I, I won't I won't look at the Q or Q Q and Q numbers that you're citing. I look at the Y or Y numbers. BFS continues to grow, as I said, 33 per 30, no, I, if I get this right, 33 or 39 percent. Travels growing almost 25 percent on a year-on-year -year basis. So these verticals are good. And the point that I do want to make is it's not a question of us being optimistic, right? Most of what I'm telling you is uh, driven of the track record built over the last 20 quarters. It's not just the last eight quarters when the demand went up during COVID that we did well. We were doing well for the three years preceding the COVID-induced demand. And a lot of the assertions that we make around driving robust, sustained, profitable growth in the quarters, in the years ahead, comes from that track record and the learnings that we've had there. Sure, I do understand that and it comes as a breath of fresh air, especially at a time when, you know, uh, peers are talking about ramp downs, clients delaying decisions, etc. Uh, I take your point and all the best for the future. Thanks a lot for joining in and giving us your view. Uh, that's Coforge, by the way, the biggest stock in focus this morning. It's up almost 5%. Very optimistic commentary from the management. They've raised their guidance and they say that even this raised guidance is a bit on the conservative side. So just keep an eye out on the stock. Let's bring you some